This is my Rose engine lathe that I built from scratch right here in my own workshop. The machine is set up specifically for engine turning guilloche work in my watch style. So that's what the machine is purpose built for. There are some Rose engines that are capable of doing ornamental turning on wood. My machine's not really set up for it in the way that the rosettes are created and the pivot function works. So specifically my machine is for engraving in metal. There are some commercially available machines, both brand new and vintage machines. Uh, they go for quite a bit of money. So I wasn't in the position to fork out that kind of money, especially when I was trying to take my case making, case back, bezel making abilities to the next level and I needed to purchase my larger milling machine as well as my lathe. So I was able to build this machine for about 10% the cost of uh, buying a new machine or buying an old machine and refurbishing it. So it came together pretty well. It was uh, really my own design. I pulled a lot of inspiration from online and some books that are out there. Uh, but really I built my machine specifically for the task that I'm uh, asking of it. So I wanted to take the opportunity today to bring you in a little bit closer. We're gonna take a look at the operation of the machine and I'm gonna do a demonstration on turning a basket weave pattern on a fine silver blank that I have mounted up in the chuck here. All right, so we'll take a look at the machine and how everything operates and I'll give a brief explanation of each of the parts of the machine that we have in front of us here. So we're gonna start at the machine uh, closest to me here. So this is just a pretty basic compound table. So it moves in the X and Y direction. I got it from Grizzly Industrial. I think it was a little over a hundred bucks. Not the best option. I think there's some other routes that I would have, go, have gone if I'm gonna do this again. Uh, there's quite a bit of backlash in the lead screws. Uh, so on X, it's like 20 thousandths and then on Y, it's about 15 thousandths. Uh, so the dial readouts by themselves were basically useless, but I did uh, compensate with that. Uh, so on top of the compound table here, I have a quick change tool post. So this actually came off of my Grizzly lathe. I replaced it with a phase two a wedge type tool post. So this is the piston type. So I use this quick change tool post specifically so I can use the adjustable height uh, tool holders, it's just a standard BXA tool holder, uh, but there is a knurled nut and then a lock nut that allows me to adjust the height. And so that's one of the most critical pieces about doing uh, engine turning guilloche work is your cutter needs to be as centered horizontally as you possibly can get it. Uh, so I built my own uh, cutter holder. So it's just a piece of aluminum that I milled some slots into to bring the overall height of my cutter down. There are two linear bearings that are connected to a linear rail that holds my actual cutter. So I have a braised carbide cutter mounted up in this little uh, tool holder that I machined out of um, mild steel. So the cutter is from Micro 100 and it's, I think it's a 40 thousandths grooving tool. So a really fine tip uh, grooving tool uh, that I was able to sharpen on some diamond wheels and get it to the exact geometry that I needed it to be. And then right next to that is what's called a guide. So basically it sets the depth of your cutter. So this is just mounted on a rail and it has quite a bit of travel. But obviously if you're just pushing your cutter straight into your work, you're not gonna have much control over the depth. So I ground out of a piece of quarter inch high speed steel, uh, my guide, it comes to a point uh, and then it's really, uh, the sharp corners are ground over and the whole thing is polished. So it only leaves just a fine burnishing mark on the workpiece uh, instead of making any grooves or scratches or cuts like that. So that's just to control your depth. Uh, right behind it is a quarter 20 socket cap screw. And so that allows me to adjust the depth and really my cutter depth uh, based on that guide. The front of the cross slide here, I have a uh, digital readout. So it's just a cheap Amazon magnetic scale digital readout, but it's precise enough for the work that I'm doing. Uh, so like I mentioned, the lead screws are not very precise on this machine and, and the readouts on the handles are pretty much useless. So I rely on my digital readout to get accurate uh, movement on my compound table, specifically in the X direction as I'm advancing my cutter towards the center of the workpiece. On the front of the spindle here, I have just a basic lathe four jaw chuck. So it's an independent four jaw chuck, which allows me to center my workpiece. Um, it allows me to do offset turning. So if I'm turning a watch style that has a sub seconds hand and I want the pattern to be concentric to that rather than 
the actual center of the watch dial where the hour and minute hands are, I can offset that. In this example, I'm turning a pendant that has an offset hole in it. And so I'm using that as the actual center of the geometric pattern rather than the precise center of the workpiece. The uh, four jaw chuck is mounted on a one inch spindle. So it's just a hardened one inch shaft, uh, hardened in ground. So I think it was within like, to 10,000, something like that was a spec sheet. I got it from McMaster. So I turned that down, uh, cut one inch by 10 thread per inch threads to screw the lathe backing chuck on. And I did all of the operations in my lathe. So I mounted the spindle up in my lathe before I made any cuts to it, machined it down, cut the threads. Then I screwed on the back plate, machined the back plate for the four jaw chuck to sit onto. So everything was concentric to the spindle as it was in my lathe. So that was a pretty important step in making sure that my lathe is centered to my spindle. On the spindle, I have a spacer and then what I call my rosette carriage. So it's a independent barrel that sits on the spindle. It's not actually keyed to the spindle at all. Uh, it holds my rosette. So right now I have six different pattern rosettes on my spindle barrel. The Phasing or the position of your rosettes is based entirely off of what's called the crossing wheel. So up here I have three sets of slots on my crossing wheel and then I have stamped the number of waves on each rosette that correspond with those. So right now my touch piece is on my 60 wave rosette. So that means there's 60 different uh, sine waves on this rosette. My crossing wheel I have made um, five cuts really there really only needs to be four and it represents a quarter of a phase so on this 60 wave rosette every time i move it over it represents moving one quarter of the phase from peak to peak on my rosettes and so i have that corresponding for each of the six rosettes that i have on here if i make more rosettes i can always add more of those slots onto my crossing wheel uh, the crossing wheel is held in place by just this spring lever here. So when I pull the lever down, you can see that the barrel moves independently. So the workpiece isn't actually moving, just the barrel and the rosettes. So that allows me to phase my rosettes and create the basket weave pattern that we're gonna go through uh, shortly here. Behind that is just a V-belt pulley uh, and a pulley hub that I got from some farm supply website. And I welded the uh, pulley onto the hub. Uh, and just give me the correct ratios. The spindle is sitting in this spindle carriage here and it's basically the shape of an H, uh, a capital H. Uh, I bored one inch and a quarter holes and I pressed in some bronze oil light bushings. So it's oil impregnated bronze bushings that don't really require a lot of maintenance. This isn't a high RPM machine and not a high load machine. Uh, so I just oil it every time I take the machine apart and just make sure that those uh, bronze bushings are well oiled. Uh, but overall it's, it's so far it's been working great for me. As a crossbar on the bottom here that really holds the uh, spindle rigid so that it's not flexing under the spring pressure. Off to the right here, I have two springs that are probably an inch and a half in diameter. And then they are on Delrin bushings that I turned on my lathe. And each of these springs is independently adjustable. So I have a half inch 20 thread uh, bolt that I can thread into the uh, spring perch bar here and adjust my spring pressure in and out. So if I'm using uh, different rosettes that require higher or lower spring pressure, I'm able to adjust that. On this side of the machine, I have just a little platform that I built to hold my touch piece. And then I also wasn't quite sure how to figure out the math at the time of centering my touch piece. So I did a similar operation like I did with my cutter where I'm using a quick change tool holder that has an adjustable post in it so I can set the height based on which touch piece I'm using and which rosettes I'm using is not necessary uh, my recommendation would be just do the math and figure out uh, a fixed height, really, because you're just trying to find the center of your touch piece versus the center of your rosettes. So an adjustable touch piece isn't necessary. So I just have a dovetail mechanism set up here. So I just uh, loosen and tighten these quarter 20 cap head screws and I can move my touch piece from rosette to rosette. So that's how I'm able to adjust which rosette I'm using to copy the pattern. And on the bottom of the machine here, I have my hand wheel. So turning this wheel also turns my spindle. And so I have some reduction. I think it's 20 turns 
of my hand wheel represents one turn, uh, something along that line, and I think it's a little too slow. So I'm probably gonna change the ratios out on my uh, larger pulley on the bottom there to get a little bit quicker, uh, since I'm not turning anything really large. And just like operating a normal lathe, as you get closer to the center, you want to increase the RPM of your spindle just to get a more consistent cut. Uh, so I'm probably gonna reduce that ratio down a little bit. The last piece is the tube steel frame that I welded together. So this is made up of inch and a half by inch and a half and inch and a half by three inch uh, square tubing and rectangular tubing. It's eighth inch wall. Uh, it's very heavy. I wanted the machine, especially in the base, to be as heavy as I could possibly get it uh, while still being able to move it around if I need to. So in a machine like this that is really using oscillation to create the pattern, you have an unsturdy base or too light of a base, the oscillation will translate into the entire machine and it can mess up your cut and, uh, and pull your cutter off course. So I wanted it to be as heavy as possible, so I'm pretty happy with how it came out. Uh, just cut it and welded it together and uh, came out great. So we're gonna dive into creating a basket weave pattern. And like I mentioned, I have a fine silver disc mounted up in the chuck here uh, that I'm gonna be turning the basket weave pattern on. So this is actually gonna be a double-sided pendant that will be enameled. So I'm just doing the first side here and we'll, we'll go through the exercise of creating that pattern. I'll show you how, we, how I do it step-by-step. Step. Here we are with the machine all set up, uh, almost ready to run. So I have my workpiece centered around the hole uh, towards the top half of the pendant here. So not actually centered on the center of the disc, but a little offset pattern that we're gonna be turning, the basket weave pattern. I also have my cutter centered height wise. And then I have also brought my cutter to the very far left of the workpiece. So since we're turning off center, we're only gonna be focusing on the left hand uh, part of the pendant at first, and then we're gonna be working our way towards the center of that hole there. So now that I have my cutter set up in the very first position that I want it to be set up in, I'm gonna zero my digital readout and make sure that my table is locked in place. I'm going to make my first pass here. And so my cutter just barely makes contact with the edge of the workpiece there. Uh, I should also mention that I am phased on my first notch in my uh, 60 wave phasing wheel or crossing wheel here. So after I've made that first cut, it's a very, very light cut uh, just on the edge there. I'm going to advance my cutter in by 8 thousandths of an inch. So I'm gonna watch for that on my digital readout. So 8 thousandths, I'm also going to advance my crossing wheel by one slot. So now my cutter's moved to the right by 8 thousandths of an inch. I have phased my rosettes to a quarter phase and so now I'm ready for my second cut. So I'm going to touch off on the workpiece. Another super, super light cut. And it's just really starting to show up on the edge there. So we're just gonna keep that process going. So I'm gonna move my compound another 8 thousandths, so to 16 thousandths. Lock it down. One more phase on my crossing wheel. So I'm gonna come back. Touch off on my workpiece. Go for another cut. So this one's just starting to show up. Clean my cutter off there. So once again, I'm gonna move by another 8,000, so up to 24 thousandths. Lock it down. I'm gonna move over to the last phase of my crossing wheel. Then I'm gonna go in for this third cut. So now we can see that cut finally starting to show up. So let me grab my little chip brush here, wipe off my cutter. So now that we've gotten to the last phase on our crossing wheel, we're gonna start moving in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna zero out my digital readout. Then I'm gonna move another eight thousandths of an inch. Lock it down. I'm gonna start moving my crossing wheel in the opposite direction. So zeroing out my cutter at the beginning of each movement is helping me maintain my trajectory or figure out which step I'm at. So I know that based on my digital readout reading, I sh know what my phase should be on my crossing wheel. So it helps me keep track of this basket weave pattern. So we're gonna move in for the next cut here. 
You can see we're pulling a good chip there. So we're gonna move another eight thousandths of an inch. A little too far, so back out. To sixteen thousandths. I'm gonna move my crossing wheel. And come in for another cut. And another eight thousandths up to 24. Lock it down and then the last place again. So this is really where we started the pattern, a little bit off the workpiece, but now we're back to that first position. We're gonna make this cut here. Come back, make sure I got the start. There we go. And then we're gonna restart that process. So we're gonna zero out the digital readout. Advance eight thousandths. Move our crossing wheel to the second position. Align and come in for a cut. Another eight thousandths on the disc here, or on the uh, compound. Move my crossing wheel. Come in for the next cut. Another eight thou. Lock it down, back to the last position on the left-hand side of the crossing wheel. Make this final cut. There we go, we can really see our uh, basket weave pattern starting to come to life. So, it comes uh, together fairly quickly once you get into the rhythm and you're, you're in the groove of knowing which direction you're moving and, and how to set up your patterns and uh, we'll come back when we're getting closer to the center there. So there we have it. The uh, basket weave is complete on the first half. So let me go ahead and get it pulled out of the four jaw here. Super hard to uh, get cameras to focus on guilloche patterns a lot of the time, but there we go, that's a pretty good look. So we can see that we have the basket weave pattern heading towards the center and then uh, about 200 thousandths away from the edge of that hole, I switched over to just a concentric circle pattern. So the problem, or I guess the main issue about doing guilloche on small pieces and heading towards the center is that the closer you get to the center, the harder the pattern is to read. Focus, you fuck. So the harder it is to read. So that's generally why I switched to the concentric circle pattern. It gives a really nice clean look and kind of finishes off that pattern and brings it in towards the center in a lot cleaner manner. So I'm gonna throw this in some acetone, dissolve the super glue holding it onto the aluminum block. And then uh, I'll flip this one over, do the same pattern on the back side, and then it's gonna get a clear enamel on both sides. God damn, that hurt. Oh. <clears throat> All right. Oh, fuck. Ow. <laughs>